Hey guys, today's show is presented by Dat Chat. So before we get into the episode, I just want to tell you a little bit about the app that is taking the Tea Tribe by storm. Basically, you could just like talk to anyone from the Tea Tribe at any time. You open the app. You can go on the website if that's easier for you. And it's like the best part about it is that you could put an expiration date on the text that you're posting. So if you want it to expire in 10 days, 30 days, 50 days, whatever it may be, you could do that. No one could take screenshots. So it's a completely safe space to talk about whatever, whenever. And you have direct access to me. And we could chat. I'm very, very, very active in there. So definitely keep an eye out and download that chat. You could download the app and make sure to join my show page. And I can't wait to talk to you guys there. Let's get into the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Tea with Publicity. I am so excited because it's live show week. Woo! I am doing my live show to no not tomorrow well tomorrow when you guys listen to this Wednesday of this week and I'm so excited to meet T Tribers IRL and um I just feel like it's gonna kind of be a shit show like I think at the after party we're just gonna be taking shots together and I might have to call out of work sick the next day so I'm getting really excited I have some amazing guests but I'll kind of recap that next week because like why bother tell you now it hasn't happened yet and by the time you listen to this episode it's probably sold out so I'm just really excited but anyway I want to talk about boys and money today which you could probably tell from the title of this episode it is just one of those episodes where it is a true mix first of all I heard your feedback I had a female financial advisor on the pod blonde broke and bougie is her Instagram handle and she told me everything I need to do kind of just the basics and I was thinking if you guys are interested we could always do a part two with a deeper dive but I didn't want to like overwhelm us with too much information because it could be quite a lot so basically we break down just like how to save money and all of that good stuff all the stuff I don't know that now I know and I felt like during our interview that I wanted to take notes um, and then I remembered that I could just listen back to this episode. So either you're going to probably want to get out a notebook. I'm not even kidding. Or just listen back to this like me because I felt like I was listening to someone speak Chinese. You know, like I hardly understood what was going on. But what I do know is that I need to open a yield savings account. So you should too. OK, so let's get into it. So why this episode is called Money and Men is mainly because one, it's the money episode. And two, it's the money episode because I was just in the Bahamas for a bachelorette party. And I think after my trip, I could do a dissertation on wealthy men because it was the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. So I literally have on my list here, bald men, daddy spending money on girls, 90210 NHL investors. So... That is a mix. And then I also have a rogue thing saying my hamster hung itself, <laughs> which is, <laughs> has nothing to do with men and money, but just a story I realize I've never told you guys. Um, all right, I'll tease it. We'll get, into, we'll get into the hamster story in a bit. But basically, I wrote that when I was drunk. Basically, the, so I went to the L- SLS Baja Mar and I would say it's a mix between the Atlantis and the Bahamas if you've ever been which is like very very big resort water slides freaking huge shops casinos like you don't have to leave the resort you could literally do everything there without ever leaving the resort so but the thing with the Atlantis is it's tons of kids so it's a mix between the Atlantis and like a Vegas or Atlantic City but I did not see one person under the age of 25 because it's really expensive and the truth is you kind of have to be making a little bit of money to go there but I felt like it was like parents gone wild or like rich single dad gone wild or even married dad gone wild and it was our party a few bachelorettes on the premises and then we just met older men who wanted to spend money on us. And I think that there is such a weird, interesting dynamic because it's like, first of all, I noticed my biggest takeaway about rich men is that they don't give 
a shit about you. Like they only wanted to talk about themselves, what they do for work, how much money they have, low key or high key flex. They didn't once ask us, what do you do for a living? Because they don't care what you do for a living because they already know that they make more money than you, which is like really hard to assume. Like I just didn't like the vibe. I was like, okay, so we would go up to a table of guys and we'd be like, oh, what are you guys here for? And they'd be like, oh, you know, like we've just got money to spend. So we're here for a few days. Then we'd be like, oh, how do you guys all know each other? Oh, yeah, we're investors. It's like that's so um, arbitrary. Like, OK, invest in what? Give us some details. But literally every table of men we went up to, what do you guys do? We're investors. By the end, I just started being like, oh, you and everyone else here. And then at one point I go to this one guy, I go, so am I which like I'm not obviously, but I was like, all right, yeah, cool. We also invest and we're also here on a private plane, which we weren't, but they don't know because they never asked. So it just like really made me realize how rich men are just so bad. Also, none of them were wearing rings. So you're telling me every guy at this hotel is single? Because I don't think so. And I asked one of the guys, I was like, are your friends married? And he goes, well, I'm not. I said, but are your friends? And he said, I'm not. In other words, yeah, they are. So um, just interesting thing to point out, which is so funny, but we had so much fun. I felt like it was like we were joking that the first day of vacation was college orientation and the last day was senior week because day one, we didn't have a table. We didn't know anyone. Day three, we like... We were like, oh, do we go to the NHL Canadian player table or do we go to the investor daddy table or do we go to the 45 year old's birthday party table? Like by the end, we had a lay of the land. Every group of the people like knew us there. One of the girls in our party was like twerking at the pool party and she was wearing a purple bikini. And by the end of the vacation, everyone was like, purple bikini girl. So like they were just stopping us. Like it was just really fun. I definitely recommend going there for a bachelorette party or for a group party I wouldn't go there with like a boyfriend because it's a very like turnt scene you know it's not like a romantic getaway but it's like really good for group parties if you're rich and you want to spend eight dollars on water um okay so then I'm sitting oh a few things here okay so I met this guy my friend went up to this guy in the pool just to chat because he was hot him and his friends and they start talking and you know what do you do for a living blah 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 he's like oh I'm an actor turns out we didn't recognize him he was in the show 90210 the new version not the old version and like victorious and what else um the lion game and now we googled him and he's in all these Christmas movies turns out I wound up talking to him for like an hour one night and like we followed each other and he works with Aaron Rodgers which is weird because we work with Aaron Rodgers like it's just such a small world so there was like a lot of interesting people there um but I was sitting at dinner one of the nights a little drunk and I got a text message um I don't know if you guys remember if you've been here from the very beginning I think it was my third episode with Devin Simone where I talked about the fact that I over quarantine was talking to someone that was a narcissist and he had multiple girlfriends in multiple countries and um, I haven't thought about it since because you know what that was a year ago and I he holds no power over me I'm sitting at dinner I get a dm from someone saying hi Alyssa I know this may be weird I listened to your episode about narcissists and I also dated xyz whatever his name is we'll call him we'll just call him narcissist she's like I also dated him around the same time you did so then I'm like now she has me intrigued not because I care about this guy but because I love drama like I love the tea so I'm like oh my god like what happened blah 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 there they seemed a little less involved than him and I because him and I were more They seemed like they were almost like friends who talked every day and then it turned like a connection. Whereas him and I were like, it seemed more like intimate maybe. But either way, she's like messed up from it. Like, so I DM his ex from LA. Oh, keep in mind, she lives in Singapore. She lives in Singapore. So I DM his ex from LA and I'm like, oh my God. 
someone reached out to me from Singapore. She goes, someone reached out to me too. I said, is this her name? No, different name. Someone else. So within a span of a week, me and his ex had two people reach out to us that weren't the same person. And then the girl from Singapore didn't know about the other girl. But this one girl from the UK is the ringleader of the bunch. She's kind of like, you know, the main girl in John Tucker Must Die that rallies the girls to confront John Tucker. This one girl in the UK is is that head bitch in charge. So she's the one that finds out about all of us and like kind of like contacts the pack. And she put together like a timeline basically of everyone overlapping. So basically he was dating someone to my knowledge in New York, LA, the UK, now Singapore, and a few others in between. One other person in New York, one other person in the UK. I think he has a girlfriend now, but apparently he also has a mistress with someone. Like, I, I want to do like a dissertation on this. And also I found out that he was potentially talking to a reporter in the US. And now I kind of want to DM the reporter and be like, let's write a fucking story. But then I'm like, do I want to get involved with this messy shit? I literally have no stake in the game anymore other than I think this is a Lifetime movie. Like, and I also, like, I think what makes me so upset about it is that, like, I wasn't messed up from it because I got out before the abuse cycle started because that's what narcissists do. They hook you in, and then once you're hooked in, then they start tearing you down and emotionally abusing you. I never got to the abuse point and I also saw red flags from the very beginning and I said to my friends I was like either this man's a con artist or he's the love of my life but like I'm leaning towards con artist so what I'm upset about is that these women that are contacting us are deeply disturbed like they are going to therapists they are fucking unwell like I'm not even kidding the damage he is doing on these people is like really sad so then I started, oh my God, this is, now I'm spilling too much tea. So I started DMing. I started DMing Teresa Judice's fiance's ex-wife. She is a narcissist specialist and she ran, like she ran a marathon in the uh, in honor of narcissistic abuse and she's an expert on the topic and I want to have her on the podcast because I think we need to do a deep dive on narcissists and their behavior and the abuse cycle and she's a therapist and even she was in the abuse cycle so like it's really fascinating so like I might have her on the podcast um yeah I'm, I'm saying too much let's talk about my dead hamster really quick before before we hop into um, the episode and talk about money, let's just talk about my dead hamster, Chester. So I haven't seen him. I mean, it's been years. He, I, I got a hamster when I was like five, I think. I don't know. I was like seven, five, something under 10 maybe. And we named him Chester. I don't know why, but we just did. Chester was wild like he was out of control we put him in like a glass cage and the the top of the cage was like checkered almost so you could like breathe you know but he couldn't escape and he would like I remember one morning I was eating cereal and hysterically crying because Chester was behind me just slamming his head into the walls like he was just like running full speed like slamming into the glass wall running to the other side slamming his head and like he was just like not okay so we were, I was, I remember eating cereal, but like, <laughs> like, as like Chester's like tearing shit up behind me. So then I remember we left for my birthday party. We were going to a salon and like everyone was like getting their hair done, whatever. We left for my birthday party. I come home from the birthday party. Chester's hanging from the top of his cage. So what he would do, what he would, he would take his wheel, like the hamster wheel and shove it into the corner of the cage so it couldn't spin like he would like sandwich it and then he would climb the cage. He would climb the wheel and like monkey bar. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. <laughs> monkey bar across the top of the cage. Like we had seen him hanging before, but he would like hang a little fall. Then we'd move the wheel back to the center of the cage. Then he would put it to the side, climb it again, monkey bar across. But this time he didn't make it. So we come home from my birthday party and Chester is hanging by all fours, feet, hands, just 
hanging. I just kicked something. Hanging from the top of the ceiling. And, like, my sister and I were obviously, like, absolutely hysterical because, like, Chester was hanging from his cage. But, like, when I tell people this now, they'll be like, oh, did you ever have a pet? I'm like, no, my parents, like, they wouldn't get us a dog after my hamster hung itself. And everyone's like, what, what do you mean? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to tell you guys that story because I thought maybe you would think it was funny because – it's pretty absurd. Um, okay, let's get into the interview. Time to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about finances. We will get back for the Ask Alyssa segment, and then we are spilling the tea because Tristan Thompson, third trimester Thompson, has another baby. Tommy Fury fumbled and pulled out of the fight. And I told you guys that I would recap Selling Sunset, and then I never did. So that's my bad. <laughs> so we will do that after. And um, yeah, here's the interview. Grab a notebook. And I hope you learned something because I know I did. Okay, guys, I am here with Becca Brenner. You may know her from Instagram as Blonde, Broke, and Bougie, which I love. <laughs> Hi, Becca. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited because you are like all thing finance and budgeting and I am all things credit card debt and <laughs> <laughs> and spending problem <laughs> not actually but but I've had some ups and downs with my finances so I know you do coaching and you tell people basically how to budget their money how to invest I want like the 411 on what women my age, our age, people that are Gen Z millennial could do to make sure that they are, one, budgeting their money okay. We'll, we'll get into all different facets. But I guess first, let me just start with this. What is like the one basic thing that every single person should be doing every single time they get their paycheck? Ooh, okay. I would say automating their savings. So every time you get paid, you shouldn't have to do anything. The number one thing that should be happening automatically is that you have money going either to a savings account, to a retirement account. Everyone should have that happening automatically because like you and I, we both want to go out and like spend mm. that money as soon as we have it. So if you have that actually going without you having to do anything, like that's going to set you up for success. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So how do I automate? What, like, So for example, like every two weeks I get paid by my company. How do I automate that one payment? Just like with my bank, I could set a feature with that? Yeah, so I'm going to get like technical right okay, away. Okay. We are just diving in. So what I recommend for like literally everyone is to open what's called a high yield savings account. So have you ever heard of that? I'm laughing because I want to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm like, okay, I can just go listen it's, back to this. I keep going to be recorded. <laughs> I keep fighting the urge <laughs> to whip out my laptop no, and start I know. like taking notes. Okay, so a high a high yield, yield savings account. So high yield? Yield. Oh, I was like, holy hell, this is right up my alley. <laughs> high yield savings account. I feel account. like you're going to like remember it forever because of high yield now. Literally. So yeah, so if you think about like most people do have a savings account, not everyone, but a lot of people have a savings account like with their bank so like if their checking account is with chase they'll have their savings account with chase yes um chase is giving you like 0.01 percent in interest which is like nothing like you may mm. see a few pennies show up in your savings account every month from chase but that's like not enough um and so there are some banks that are called high yield savings accounts or that have high yield savings accounts those are usually online banks so they can afford to pay you more they like incentivize you to keep your money with them because they don't have as much overhead wow so, so could you give an example of like one yeah so marcus is a common one it's owned by goldman sachs um ally is another one hmm. they have like different pros and cons they're all fine um capital one has a high yield savings account if you want like a more standard bank. Mm -hmm. um, and so with all, any of these, you can set it up. So every two weeks or twice a month, it takes $100 or $50 or $500 mm. from your checking account and goes straight there. What about those apps that do it for you? Like Acorns or whatever. So I, I'm not a fan of Acorns specifically because they invest in ways that like when I was a user of it, I couldn't really understand what they were doing. Yeah. And like, if I can't understand, like, I don't, I want, if something's doing something for me, I still want it to be like teaching me what it's doing. Mm -hmm. So in particular, I'm not a fan of Acorns. A lot of people use like other ones that just save the money. And those are fine. But I think that you should be more in control of your finances versus like letting something do it for you. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do that as like icing on the cake, 
that's a good idea, but I think like it's better to be a bit more reflective and say like I can do a hundred dollars a paycheck and have that happen, like set that up yourself, in my opinion. Okay, interesting. So what is like the how much money do you think people should start putting aside from every paycheck? Like what's a good starting point? So it's hard because it's like different for everyone. Based on your like income. Yeah, and we live in New York, so it's everything is so expensive yeah. here. But what people will say, like people, the like personal finance mm-hmm. overlords will say that you need to save like 10 to 15 percent of your paycheck for retirement to be able to comfortably retire like at the same level of spending that you have now. So that's like. Oh, this already gives me anxiety. <laughs> okay, so I have a question. So for example, yeah. for me, I'm already putting money into my 401k. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm like maxing out my 401k. Oh, you're doing so great if you're maxing it out. I, I, okay, so this is where I struggle because everyone's like, oh my God, that's great. Your 401k. I'm like, yeah, but what about now? Like what if I need saving? What if I lose my job tomorrow okay. and then I have to pay my rent? Like my 401k is not going to bail me out. Totally. So I need savings within a bank. Yes. You know? So that's where your high yield savings account comes yes. in. Yes. Okay. So what you want to do is have three to six months of living expenses in your high yield savings account, and that's your emergency fund. So that's like if you lost your job tomorrow. So in New York, that's like freaking $30,000. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's so yeah. ridiculous. Well, okay. But I like to tell everyone like this should be personal finance. Everything is personal. But this especially should be personal. If you lost your job tomorrow, you have multiple income streams. You wouldn't be like out of luck. So you may be able to have a smaller emergency fund mm-hmm. knowing that in those situations you could like capitalize on some of your mm-hmm. other Fair. income streams. Whereas someone who's like nine to five, that's it, has a family to take care of. Like that person needs six months of mm-hmm. their savings mm-hmm. like set aside like so it really depends on who you are. But yes, it's a lot of money. And in theory, like I want all of my money invested because it's going to like yield me the most money in the end. But with a with an emergency fund, if you invest that, you run the risk of losing it. Exactly. So, so you, you don't kind want of to be there. need an emergency fund. So yeah. the way my fan- finances are set up right now, based on someone who has no idea what the hell she's doing, I'm just like very risky, which isn't necessarily great. But you could be completely risk adverse like my dad always says he yeah. was so scared to put his money into stocks and he's like I could have had triple because had I just invested you know I would have had more to retire with whereas I don't want to make that same mistake but my finances have been so dicey because once I oh, I'll give you guys a little brief history of my finances I think it's so important for women to be open about this stuff first of all When I first graduated college, my job, I was making under $30,000 a year. I was making no money, living in New York City. And my parents were like, we will help you pay your rent for the first year. So they were giving me like X amount of money towards rent. Granted, yes, they were giving me a lot of money towards rent, but it was still a lot out of my $28,000 salary pocket. You know what I mean? So that already kind of set me up for failure. Even though they did the nicest gesture for me, I couldn't afford my rent then after that year. So as my jobs and my salary kept increasing, I always was playing catch up because I was living in New York. And then finally I was making decent money when I was working in PR full time and making like real money off Instagram because then I had two salaries. So instead of doing the responsible thing and you know, everyone's like, you need to save 30% for taxes because now I was like a freelancer. I was putting all that money away in a savings But considering that mentally, oh, this is my savings, not this is my tax money. I was lumping it into one. So then when it came time to pay taxes, I had, I went through all my quote unquote savings. Yeah. Which was a first mistake. Tax every time I pay my, I pay quarterly taxes. Yes. Every time I'm like, oh, like a piece of my heart. Oh, it's it's like thousands of dollars. But I should have never looked at it as. Yeah. Savings is my point. Like you almost have to look at it like you don't even have that. Yeah. I have two different savings accounts. Um, They're both okay. in Marcus, but I have one that's my emergency fund and one that's my tax fund. So it's exactly, exactly. what I'm doing. Exactly. So I did one. Now I know learning. So if you guys have, if you guys are 1099, I think having two savings accounts sounds like the right move, right? Yeah. So then I learned that the hard way. <laughs> now I think I'm better. When I started working for this job, now I'm back on payroll versus being a freelancer. So I started putting money away each month. But, and I have a 401k now, which I didn't have before, which was which is nice. But I still feel like just with rent and expenses and living in the city, the more money you make, the more expenses you have. And it's still always hard to catch up. So like day to day, what are things that I could do to budget my money um, for example, 
I used to take Ubers all the time. Now I'm Subway through and through. Oh, yeah. No sober Ubers. No. Yeah, I love that. No sober yes. Ubers. When That's you're drunk, so you're allowed. Funny. But otherwise, no sober Ubers. I don't care if it's raining. Like, no. Yes. Okay. So what could people do, like, in their everyday life, minus the, like, um, make coffee at home, home versus buy it out? Like, are there little things that we are spending money on that, like, we're not even aware of? I mean, a lot of the times, yes. Like, if you ever check your subscriptions, you'll be like, oh, my God. Like, I haven't used that. This happened to me the other day. Like, when I, I paused coaching for a bit, and I was still paying $15 a month for Zoom for my coaching. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can pause that and restart it. So there's always subscriptions and things like that. Oh, but I'm the worst at that. See, yeah, I've been paying for bad. Zoom for, like, two years, and I don't need it. Yeah, and it's it's not a lot of money. Like, $15 a month in the end, like, at the end of the day, is not going to make or break me. But, but it, it's, adds it adds up. And it's, like, a bunch of things like that. So checking your subscriptions is always good. Um, I think like something that I like to recommend or like kind of a saying that a lot of people will say in personal finance is like you can afford anything you just can't afford everything Mm. so kind of picking the things that you value like I value this is not actually for me but for someone like I value going to restaurants so I'm gonna make sure that like I only eat at home unless I'm going to meet a friend at a restaurant like no Mm. delivery no Um, like fast casual nothing like that or like I value clothes so I'm gonna not go to restaurants so much and I'm gonna focus on buying clothes so it's really about like what do you value and then making sure like you cut the places that you don't value as much or that don't like actually bring you happiness like yes I want to go to sweet green but is that $15 salad gonna bring me like that much happiness maybe not so like cutting those areas and then spending on the areas that like actually bring you happiness oh I spend money on everything. I'm I know. So I'm like, bad. well, I want to go on vacation and I want to look cute on vacation and yes. I want to buy skincare. I know it's hard, but even sometimes I just like rotate. Like I'll be like, this month I'm not doing this. Like this month yes. I'm not buying clothes, and then next month like I'm not going out to eat at all. Like even it's just like s- mini challenges switching. for yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there like a form or sheet that you use? Like at the start or beginning of every month, do you physically write out a budget, or do you kind of just know now based on memory? Like this is what I'm doing. So I use Mint. It's a free app. I have used it. I literally, like, I I kid you not, have checked it every single day since 2015. Like, it's like, I feel like you're like, wow, like you're crazy. No, Uh, (laughs) I'm more like, wow, I'm savage. No, I need. You are maxing out your 401k. So you like have to, like, that is so great. You have to give yourself credit for that. I know, but then my paycheck is. Yeah, so but sad. still, you're doing <laughs> yeah. great. Um, but yeah, Mint is the name of the app, and it connects automatically to all of your, like, accounts, and it's safe. Like, it's they can't, like, hack your accounts or anything. Mm-hmm. But um, so all my transactions show up there. So every morning I open it up, and I look, and I say, like, okay, yesterday I spent this. That goes in this category. Oh, my God, I need to do this. Yeah, it's great because, like, I, I even, like, sell Excel sheets, but I don't use it. Like, I, I prefer to have – as much automated as possible and then just like minimal interference to make sure things are going the right way. So Do you know why this gives me anxiety? Because I'm going to notice how many subscriptions and stuff I have that that's I don't That's great use. though. It's, it'll be like a wake up call but in a good way. I have a confession. Okay. I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> I judge me. <laughs> so like two, three years ago. This is really bad, guys. I'm also very avoidant. Like, when I don't want to fix something, I just avoid it, thinking it's going to go away, which yeah. it's not going away. I signed up for Blink Fitness, that, like, gym that's $20 a month, like, three years ago. I think I still get charged every month. The gyms make it, like, impossible because to cancel. I wouldn't know because unless you go in person. And I'm so embarrassed to go in there, which is so wrong. I have not canceled. I'm pretty sure I've been getting charged for Blank Fitness, twenty dollars a month for okay. three years. So what I always like, mo- <gasps> what motivates me Sorry. with like those and with like returns is like that's money you get to spend somewhere else. So don't think of it as like, oh, I'm losing money. Be like, oh, I'm so excited. I now have twenty dollars a month that I can go like get my nails done another mm-hmm. time. Yeah, because like, I've been spending it anyway. Yeah. For the last- three years but you don't have to feel as guilty about it because now you'll have 20 more dollars there's always like a positive way to spin it oh my god it's so bad though (laughs) so okay so if I do mint I'll see when I get charged for stuff like that basically yeah and you should be like everyone should really be checking their credit cards anyway just for like fraud purposes and so I like mint too just in case because sometimes I'll see something and I'm like 
what is that? Yeah, and this it's almost is weird. always me, but. You know what I noticed? Like recently I went to a hotel and they were like, we need to put a $600 charge on your credit card for incidentals. Mm. And at the end, we'll refund you. And I noticed like two weeks later, I still hadn't got the money back. Yeah. So it's like stuff like that even, just being aware. Like, oh wait, they didn't refund my card. Maybe I need to look into this. Yeah, there's so much stuff like that. And sometimes I'll like, freak out and be like oh my god I forgot to like look at like mm-hmm. and then you have like all this anxiety but like if you're looking all the time you're gonna notice those things and you can like take care of them right away oh my gosh okay so in terms of investing where do you get your information from like where do people even begin to learn the slightest thing about investing well can I like shamelessly self-promote you can yeah. take my course okay I have a whole like module on investing but um in general investing is a lot you, you don't have to be an expert in investing to invest. And I think that that's like a big misconception that people think like they need to do all this research on like different companies and stocks and things. Mm-hmm. And like that's a huge barrier to entry for investing. And yeah. you really, really don't. So you have a couple of options. You can do research. Honestly, there's a ton of investing Instagram accounts that like give the best information. I can like one of my favorites is at Personal Finance Club. Mm. He is like a retired 40 35 year old man who like lives off his investments and he gives like really simple information but there's tons of instagram accounts but you can also just invest with a robo advisor and you don't have to know you you should research any investment Mm -hmm. that you make but you don't have to know the specific investments if you use a robo advisor because they're going to make the investing choices for you so they're like I don't an, even know what that means. A ro- like a robot? Essentially. So if you think of like a financial advisor, mm-hmm. that's like a human being who is like managing your money. Mm-hmm. A robo advisor is that, but it's a computer. So they're, and they're doing it for and you. And they're successful or mm-hmm. hmm. so yeah. So there's been tons of studies that have shown that like three out of four financial advisors actually don't do better than the stock market as a whole. Interesting. Because they're actively moving money so much that like they're making bad choices mm. in the end because it, it's honestly luck like the stock market is gambling yeah so it is you just don't know like you could be like oh this dropped a hundred dollars so I'm gonna invest in it because it's gonna go back up and then it could drop another hundred dollars like you just have no idea so doing a robo advisor they're gonna be like a bit more conservative and not move your money around a ton which is a good thing and then you don't have to like necessarily um do as much research on the individual investment so it's a great Mm -hmm. like first step into investing that's how I started investing and then as I got more comfortable and I actually like learned a lot by using the robo advisor I was like oh they're investing in this let me look look Mm -hmm. at what that is interesting and so now when I invest I don't put more money into the robo advisor but I'm kind of following a similar strategy just on my own so what give me an example of like is is the robo advisor a website an app Yeah, so there's a few that I recommend. So Wealthfront and Betterment are two that are very similar. Um, They both have apps and websites. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm an app user. I don't like like to log on stuff. So that's an option. Um, Elevest is another one, and they are more catered towards women. So their fees are a little bit higher, um, but it's great because it's, like, mission-driven, and Mm -hmm. they have options to invest in, like, different types of portfolios that kind of do good and some of the other like Wealthfront does that too so like how much money do you think people have to have to invest so for example I this is what I'm always curious about I'm like could I invest a hundred dollars could I invest five hundred a thousand whatever right now I think I have about like two thousand dollars invested in stocks because to me that just felt safe I didn't want to do I'm not one of those people that's going to put like ten thousand dollars into stocks at this moment it's just way too risky for me but as I see something, I'll, you know, like I'll buy a little crypto. I'll buy a little <laughs> this. I really have no idea what the hell I'm doing. So I really need um, to be more in tune. But how much money do you think like an average person, if they're scared like me, and they just want to like play around with the little money to see, what do you think like a good number to start with is? Well, you could invest with a dollar. Like it depends yeah. on the platform. Some platforms have minimums, but I wouldn't think of it necessarily. Like I, I don't frame it that way. I okay. think like put as much as you can into retirement because you're going to get tax benefits from doing that mm-hmm. and then kind of like work your way down from there. So once you've maxed out all your retirement options, which for most people is like an employer sponsored option, like a 401k or a 403b, um, and you can talk to your employer about that, um, then you would go to or 
maybe first you would go to an IRA, which is an individual mm-hmm. retirement account, and you don't need an employer. So if your employer is like, I'm not helping you with anything with retirement, you can go to an IRA. Um, so once you've gotten those, that's where you're going to get all the tax benefits, which is huge. Like in New York City, we pay so much in taxes. And if we can knock that down a little bit, that mm-hmm. makes a huge difference. You end up with like thousands more dollars. Um, once you do those, then you want to think about like playing around in other types of investments. But um, even within those accounts, you can play around if you want to. But I'll tell you, like of my portfolio, um, maybe 5% is in individual stocks that I've picked. Like, Mm. I don't really do that at all. I'm way more invested in funds, which are made up of, like, a million different stocks. I see. And that way they're, like, diversified. I'm not worried about the performance of any one company. I'm more looking at, like, on the whole, how is the stock market doing? And my portfolio goes with that. Interesting. Okay. Oh my gosh. You're They're, not trying to like beat anyone. I feel like that's like I know, a big I look at it as like gambling. Yeah. You're like, how do I win? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how do I invest in like Tesla and like yes. blow up? You know what I mean? And like one in every million people does that and is super successful, but most of the rest of the people are not. And like I always tell people, I'm like, you're not gonna win that way. And I'm not saying that because I think you're stupid. I think totally. that I'm not gonna win that the way. Odds. Like no yeah. one is gonna win that way. Like it is just so hard for that to be the way that you're successful. Whereas if you're investing in index funds or ETFs, like things that are made up of a lot of stocks, your chances of being successful are so much higher. Okay, interesting. That's really good to know. So, oh my gosh, I feel like you're such like a wealth of knowledge. I feel like I'm just like vomiting stock information at you. It's (laughs) really remarkable, number one. Number two, it's making me, honestly, it's eye-opening. I think immediate next steps for me and for anyone else that's listening that I think are the baseline things that we all should do from what you're saying is get a um what did you call the savings account high yield savings high yield savings account because right now I do have a savings account with Chase but what I would like to do is create a second savings account where I'm just putting a percentage every month into and because my Chase one sometimes I go into that like let's say i want to treat myself to something like once a year I buy myself something for my birthday like I'll usually take that for my savings because I that money's there for big purchases you're like it shouldn't be no I'm like can I offer you an alternative yes give me um okay so in any of these savings accounts depending on like the high yield one depending Mm -hmm. on which you pick they have options to make buckets or separate accounts okay so what I recommend for people is that you have one bucket that's your emergency fund And in your case, what you're telling me is you want kind of like a treat yourself bucket. Mm -hmm. I would put that in your high yield savings account is money dedicated for that purpose. So I could just bucket them differently. So within my savings account, I could have two different buckets. Exactly. Because I think it's so important to have specified what the money is for because so many people fall into that situation we were talking about earlier where it's like, I have $15,000. I can do whatever I want. Uh And it's like, no, half of that's for taxes and then half is your emergency fund and you don't even have enough for three months. Like it just – you if. It's so easy to like round up when it's all grouped together. Okay, so what I was thinking, which is kind of what you're saying, is keeping my Chase savings as like, oh, this is my savings I could dabble with maybe potentially. Not that I'm dipping into it all the time, but this is like if I need, I don't know, if I need X amount of money for something a little extra one month, I can go there. And then my high yield savings will be my one that's for retirement. That's my, not retirement, I'm sorry, that's for um Emergencies. Emergencies. Yes. So like just keeping them in two separate accounts. You're saying basically do that under one account in two categories. Yeah. And the only benefit, well, there's a couple benefits to moving them all to the high yield savings account. Number one is you'll get more interest. Mm -hmm. It has a higher yield. That's the whole like purpose behind it. And once you see, once you put like your emergency fund in the high yield, you'll be like, oh, that's a lot more money than I was getting before. And Mm -hmm. you'll like want to move, you'll, you'll be incentivized to move it over. But also I think that when you keep your money in your bank, it's almost too easy to spend. Like, I know. That's why I want – I like to keep it yeah. somewhere else. So keeping it elsewhere and then saying, like, this is for once a quarter, I'm going to treat myself to something. And having that separate, it's, like, so clearly defined what that's for. And you won't be, like, dipping in for random things. But you I do totally have, like, agree. permission. Yeah. Like, when I first started, I had a Bank of America savings because that's just always what I had. Like, yeah, me checking. Yeah, me too. My, yeah. Everyone, like, that's their starter card. Can I tell you something awful? Yeah. So this is not awful because I had a lot of money, but I had $50,000 sitting in that savings account, (gasps) which is like a cardinal sin. Because there's just no. Yeah, there's zero benefits. And and I say that like 
I, having fifty thousand dollars in any form is like a huge Amazing. privilege, yeah. and, and I'm proud that I was able to do that. But like looking back, I'm like I was an idiot. Like yeah, there were like, so I... many better things I could have done. Mm, it's so fascinating, right? Because people get nervous. You don't know enough. You... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, people so, were like invest, and I was like, no. What if yeah, I need like, it? What? Yeah. yeah. So I had a Bank of America checking and savings and then when I created a chase savings that you're you could only technically pull out of three times a month oh yeah if you have to so I I didn't look at that account every day because I was just in my bank of America and then my chase was my savings and I put it away and that's kind of what I'm thinking about this new account that I'm now going to open when we're done here that I could just put my money away like you said in a different bank that you can't really reach and it's just like your money for a rainy day exactly um, okay, I love that. So that's the first thing I think every single person should do no matter what it sounds like. The second thing I'm going to do that I also think why like we all should be doing is doing um, the Mint app just to see what we're spending money on, making sure that nothing's fraudulent. Mm-hmm. And then also it sounds like just following accounts like that guy that you mentioned that could just like teach us a little bit about investing because I know the thing with for me is like I don't know a lot but I I'm, I like to learn so I just need someone to teach me. Yeah. It's it's super interesting too. Like once you start to learn, I think people think there's just so much information out there, which there is. Like I feel like I'm an expert and I also feel like I probably know only 50% of the information yeah, out totally. there. Like there's just so much out there and it's just like learning – once you get like the basics it's super interesting you'll be really like excited to invest and then just start like don't be like well there's one more thing I need to learn Mm. just like go for it I think for me my first step is like just clearing up my personal finances and getting rid of things like that zoom subscription that I don't use and yeah I get google charges me and this like I'm getting charged for all these things and I just need to take inventory over what I'm spending money on better. Totally. I think like doing a financial audit is really great Mm -hmm. for people. So just going through and saying, what am I spending in a month? What accounts do I have open? Half the time people have credit card accounts that they don't even know about, like from a store card they opened years ago. Like just figuring out what you have and then figuring out your net worth. So like there's three steps that I would say, like what am I spending? What do I, what are my accounts and what is my net worth? And your net worth is just like everything you have minus everything you owe. So I was just gonna say I don't think I have a net worth because I don't own anything. You have money in your investments, your four hundred one k. You said, oh true, you're checking all I'm that. thinking though, like you know, people own houses yes. and assets. Living in the city, we don't we have don't cars. Own yeah. We don't own anything. Like I don't own anything. You have money. Your money counts. So um, any like you do own if you have a four hundred one k, and that's invested, then you do own investments I don't know what they are but mm-hmm. you you do own something there um, I would also include any savings checking everything like that and then you want to subtract out student loans credit card debt mm-hmm. if you have a mortgage car loan those sorts of things mm-hmm. so figuring out what your net worth is because a lot of the times people get kind of hung up on like one side of the equation like yeah. how much I have in savings and that's it that's the only thing I care about but in reality if you have fifty thousand dollars in savings and a hundred thousand dollars of student loans that doesn't tell you the full picture Mm. so i always recommend to everyone that they figure out their net worth and there's apps to help with that too mint does that um (laughs) mine's gonna be like (laughs) net worth (laughs) ten (laughs) dollars a lot of people are negative it's okay like and people especially people with student loans a lot of the time start with a negative net worth when they like start Mm. this process the one thing i'm thankful that i don't have i have like no loans like i don't owe anything anyone anything thank god um but it's so it's just like money is just such a scary thing yeah and I've even learned through like going to therapy and stuff how much of a trigger it is for me because I don't know it's just something about it feels so like out of control I think living in a a city where the rent's so expensive it's really rent that adds the most stress to my plate I have to say totally rent is crazy I just moved into my own apartment in um August for the first time I've always had roommates Mm -hmm. and now having that like single person rent I'm like oh I'm like this is is a lot it's a lot to adjust to for sure it's really a lot no I totally agree okay well thank you so much this was like so helpful where could everyone follow you and like stay up to date and download your course and all of that yeah so I'm at blonde broke and bougie on everything it's kind of hard to spell but I'm sure it'll be like in all the details yeah it's it's kind of a mouthful I don't really know what I was thinking in 2018 when (laughs) I when I started um but yeah I'm on Instagram on TikTok blondebrokenbougie.com is where you can find my coaching sessions my course my templates that I have lots of different stuff on there um yeah 
I think I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if people have more questions, we'll bring you on for a part two because I feel like everyone's going to be like, <laughs> it's almost one of those conversations where you feel relieved but stressed at the I same know. time because you're like, now I have so much I need to do. I feel like I like teased everyone with like a lot of information about a lot of different topics. <laughs> everyone's going to be like, now what? We like, need more. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys have any questions, write in and we could always do a deep dive for part two. But these are just like, I wanted everyone to get the basics of like an understanding of what we should be doing. Yeah, totally. I feel like we did steps one, two, and three. Yes. And, and maybe we could do there. four, five, yeah. and six next time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Okay. You guys have heard me talk about it before. And let me just tell you that I've been really, really, really thankful lately to have my taser with me on the subway. I don't know why, but more now than ever before, have I felt like really kind of nervous actually in the city. And I've never said that before because I always feel so comfortable, but things have just been really weird. So having my taser on me makes me personally feel like I'm in control of my safety. And whether you live in New York City or LA or Atlanta or wherever, or you're just in the suburbs or you're going hiking. Like the other day, my sister was hiking and saw a freaking bear. So no matter what you're doing, I feel like it is best case scenario to have a taser on you to protect yourself. And I'm really excited because you can get the taser pulse plus today and save 15% at taser.com slash discount slash T spelled T A S E R.com slash discount slash T T taser.com slash discount slash T supplies are limited and restrictions do apply. So just see the website for details. Make sure that you could have one in your area, but why not protect yourself or give the gift of protecting to someone this holiday season? Okay, guys, it is time for Ask Alyssa. It's just me today, so you get my undivided attention. This person said, Ask Alyssa. Queen publicity. I need help. My brother-in-law was laid off from his job in March 2020, just before the pandemic, and has remained unemployed since. But my sister has worked the whole time at a restaurant over 50 hours a week, even during her whole pregnancy before giving birth April of this year. After an emergency C-section, she went back to work and has been back to her 40-plus hour work week, working nights away from her baby. My brother-in-law is great is a great husband-in-law and father, but him being unemployed creates a ton of tension in the family. His unemployment money ran out about two months ago, and she has since asked me for loans to pay her bills and support her son, but he won't even look for a job. I want to support her, but not enable him. Please help. (gasps) That sucks for you because it's your sister and her baby, and, like, you want them to be okay, but at the same time, you definitely will be enabling him. Why, I don't understand why he, why can't he get a freaking job? That is nuts to me. I can't even like almost wrap my head around that. Maybe he's depressed. Like it almost sounds like the lack of motiva- motivation is debilitating to him because I feel like money is one of the biggest stressors in the world. So like if that if having a new baby isn't stressing him out enough, like what isn't clicking? Um would you feel comfortable talking to him? Like is it something where you could say to him like, "Look, I'm like I want to help you guys, but it's kind of putting me in a tough position. Um is there anything I could do to help you? Like I want to make sure that you both are able to stand on your two feet oh that puts you in such an awkward position this sucks I think you need to talk to your sister and be like I'm happy to help but what the hell is going on with your husband like why isn't he able to help you I don't want you to think I'm not here for you but I want him to step up for you and I'm just feeling like there's a disconnect I think you really just need to have like open communication in this instance um and it's it's honestly just really unfortunate I I hope that I hope that they're able to come to a solution very soon. And if there's an update, please do let us know. Okay, so I am going to read some of my scandalous story submissions from my Instagram for this week's Ask Alyssa because they are freaking juicy. And some of you kind of preface them more so as questions, less than statements. So I will do my best to help you guys. But y'all are wild out here. Okay. A lot of people saying this. I'm in love with my coworker who has a girlfriend. Help. Girl, back off. I mean, he has a girlfriend. I'm 
assuming he's giving you indication potentially he's into you or he's just friendly I think sometimes when we find people attracted attractive if they're nice to us we think they're into us does that make sense like sometimes if I'm talking to a hot guy I'm like he loves me but then I'm like no he's just hot so I think he loves me if he was ugly we we'd be having the exact same conversation and I wouldn't think anything of it so I think you just need to maybe reposition your thinking or just like if like if and when they break up then maybe that's your opportunity but until then you can't think about the what if because like he has a girlfriend and if he is ble- being flirty with you while he has a girlfriend who's to say when he's dating you the same thing's not going to happen like a sketchy person's a sketchy person period this person said I can't sleep without dreaming of my guy best friend and me having sex I can't see him without thinking about it help me please how do I get these thoughts out of my head okay so I think I mentioned this in my Thanksgiving episode and if I didn't I'm embarrassed to say and I hope no one that knows this man listens to this but I still have like graphic dreams about my high school boyfriend and like (laughs) like, every single night when I was home for Thanksgiving (laughs) and like I don't think about him so like I think maybe my subconscious because I was like in my hometown and on my previous podcast before I ever had the podcast here I had a dream expert on and she told me that your first love and men in your life will forever come up in your dreams. She was like, I'm a 60 year old woman and my high school sweetheart comes up in my dreams. And she said, it's not about them. It's about what they represent to you. So for example, my ex-boyfriend from high school represents like first love. So maybe like I'm feeling a void because I am like, I want to be in love. So then it shows up as him in my dream whereas with you and your guy friends like maybe he's the representation of like the kind of relationship you want or the way you want to be treated with with someone so it keeps like coming up as him in your dreams if that makes sense or maybe you're really awake and you're just fantasizing so maybe you should just check if you have feelings for him deep down inside but I think that's a really interesting perspective to think about it that way it's almost like they're coming up in your dreams because they're filling a void for something that you want and the need that you want fulfilled Bam. Okay, we are going to spill the tea. There's a lot to discuss. Um, I did a little TikTok on this, and and you guys probably saw, but um, Tristan Thompson, this mother effer, um, he's welcomed a new baby to the world, one that he does not want to be a part of their life. Basically, text messages were leaked, allegedly, but they looked pretty legit to me. It looked like they were through Snapchat, which is even more sketchy because he knew they would disappear. But welcome to the to the 21st century. Nothing disappears. Receipts are taken. So basically, Tristan was like, I will give you $75,000 to shut your mouth and get rid of this child because when the child comes, I will not be in its life. He was basically threatening her. He was basically saying, get an abortion, take my money, and shut up or have the baby and I'm retiring from basketball and you will have nothing so ew maybe it's called use a condom Tristan it's called pull out it's called plan b I don't understand my mom used to say to me in high school and college she'd be like there is no reason in this current climate to accidentally get pregnant listen I know it happens I'm not judging any of you guys if it happened to you or whatever but Tristan Thompson you are rich you're powerful you have money why are you raw dogging these girls out here and I hate to be frank but like busting in them when you know you're rich and famous and you are a cheater if you're gonna cheat cover your tracks wrap your willy pull out like I I just don't really understand um how he is being so sloppy I don't get it and that's really what blows my mind about this all and we know he's a cheater at this point and it is alleged that he was with Chloe during this time frame when he got this woman pregnant and it's just gross like I know I think Chloe's been done with him for a while because she hasn't been wearing that ring um but it just sucks that she has to keep getting dragged back into this because she did leave him I think they're broken up and he just can't stop and it's been nine months and now this baby's here and I wish the baby and the mom well but I just think he has genuinely a sex addiction problem he should hang out with my ex (laughs) 
would be great friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, interesting. So anyway, Tristan, third trimester Thompson. I, I just can't. Um, in other news, Tommy Fury, he backed out of the fight against Jake Paul. You guys know I was riding car- hard for team Tommy Fury. I made merch, Love Island merch, Molly May merch. I'm still keeping it up on the website because I'm forever team Love Island and I will forever want to be Molly May when I grow up, even though she's 21 and way younger than me. But the truth of the matter is I need Tommy to make a statement as a publicist. I would advise that he gets on screen with a freaking neck brace on or his shoulder wrapped because there is no excuse for him to pull out of this fight unless he literally is severely injured. Because if you just have like a cough or like a cold or like a minor injury, what's the reasoning that you pulled out of this fight? I know for a fact he was training hard. Because I watched Molly May's vlogs and she said like she hadn't seen him in three weeks. He was training so hard. I know he was putting in the time. So I want to believe him and believe that he really, really, really got injured. But we don't really want to see Tyrone Woodley fight Jake Paul again. We already saw this. It's like the whole fight now is just in my opinion, bleh. I'm still going to watch it. But now I'm rooting for Jake Paul. (laughs) I completely flopped because this is how it is. I rooted for Jake Paul in his other fights because I'm always going to be on the side of the internet. Like I want to see influencers make an impact. So I always would root for Jake Paul when he was going against other people like Nate Robertson, Nate Robertson, Tyrone Woodley. Now that he's not fighting Tommy, I'm back to rooting for Jake. But because he was going up Tommy, who I love dearly, I would defend Tommy until the end and I still am riding with Tommy but I am devastated if you have no idea what I'm talking about I work in sports I don't really talk about sports but like I'm kind of just in this world and also I'm obsessed with Love Island so get on board okay last story Selling Sunset I told you guys I would recap I told you to watch it over Thanksgiving as homework Um, it's been a few weeks now so if you haven't watched it spoilers up ahead but If you completed your homework, I want to thank you, class, for doing that. Um, So Selling Sunset, (sighs) I mean, it's fine. It's entertaining. I think I might have talked, did I talk about this on last week's episode? Am I going crazy? I think I said this somewhere, but I don't, something about Chris Shell to me is not likable. And I love women. Like, I don't know what it is. But something is like a little tad off to me. I feel like I said this before. Um, Listen, do I beef with her? No. Do I want her to do well? Absolutely. Something on screen isn't necessarily translating for me. I did talk about this because I talked about how I saw the Oppenheim twins and they were like two feet tall. But what I will say is that there's this whole conspiracy going on that Christine wasn't pregnant because of the way she bounced back so quickly. Um... No, she was pregnant. There's pictures of her bump. She didn't lie. I think that people that think that is crazy. Obviously, she's not the standard for bouncing back. But I don't ever look at... I think people look at women who bounce back quickly and internalize it. I don't look at it like that. I look at it like, wow, you are one lucky person. That's not going to be my reality. But good for you that it is. Like, you just can't be jealous, you know? She looked snatched two days after giving birth, and it's just the fact of the matter. She's a fit girl. She's really tall. She did Pilates throughout her entire pregnancy. It is what it is. People are just mad because she looks good. Let's face it. And she looks great. It, it's it's not on her to, like, keep weight on to make the public happy. She can't help it. She pushed the baby out, and, like, she never even had a huge bump to begin with. Like, she stayed slender throughout her entire pregnancy. So it is what it is. Overall selling sunset season, I will give it a rating of a 6.5. I think next season is going to be much better because we'll get a new storyline with Chriselle and Jason dating. I think the whole, like, this whole season was basically centered around fake drama and they couldn't even all get together to see a film together until the last episode which was so dumb because any other reality show like Housewives, Jersey Shore, whatever you're watching if they have drama they put them in the same room like Angelina and Wow hated each other guess what they filmed together Sonia and so and so were fighting Leah whatever guess what they filmed together 
this was the only show that literally kept them separate and it was annoying because it was the same storyline and nothing was getting resolved. So I'm hoping next season we see a little bit more resolution. We see them move on and we get like a new storyline with Jason and Chriselle and that will at least be interesting. Okay, guys, that's it for today's episode. I'm tired of talking. My mouth is dry. I will talk to you guys next week. I can't wait to fill you in on my show and make sure you're following me everywhere. Wait, rate five stars, leave a review, and I will talk to you next week.